Hey, everyone. I want to welcome you to this episode of the HX Podcast. Uh, you know, I'm really excited today for the conversation we're going to have. I am honored uh, to have my friend Howard Lindzen uh, join us. Howard is the founder and CEO of Stock Twits, as well as the founder or one of the founders and general partner of a very successful venture capital firm called Social Leverage. Uh, Howard, first off, let's start. How you how you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for having me. I'm in Coronado. Where are you? Uh, I am in beautiful New Milford, Connecticut. So you know, not not quite, <laughs> not quite as scenic. <laughs> the the uh, I guess I should say the only two things that matter. I should always say this. People ask me what what I'm my position. I'm also the uh, I own and operate two millennials. Okay, I've, I've launched them into I've launched them into the universe. They they barely rely on me. <clears throat> Which is a miracle, I think, in its own right. And well, we, we went through I'll your money most, making enterprises first, and those are the money losing enterprises. So, <laughs> you know what? With with them out of the house, um, a lot of my edge is gone. You know, the, luckily they came of age during Web two. Okay, and um, looking over their shoulders, you know, oh six, you know, with the YouTube and. You know, switch to iPhone and the iPad really, really was a bonus in my job. You know, now I'm can only invest in stuff I use. Right, right. Which limits. You know, anyways, we can get yeah, into yeah. that later. Well, but you know, having kids around is great. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story, and then we're going to jump into it. I literally had the other day. Um, you know, at, at, at Empire, my previous newsletter company, big company. You know, they were very. They didn't do much social media. With this, we've launched all the social media. So I've got my YouTube channel. It's ramping up. This will be on YouTube. And my son comes up to me the other day. He's fascinated that I have a YouTube channel. He's ten, and he goes, he goes, Daddy, Daddy, did you just drop a new YouTube video? I'm like, Yeah, I, th I think we did. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. I haven't promoted it yet goes yeah i was the first viewer on your youtube video <laughs> which which kind of freaked me out a little bit too so so let's do this howard you and i have known each other for about four or five years uh we met through uh our mutual friend herb greenberg awesome guy uh you know former colleague of mine um i know a little bit about your background <laughs> um you know that you uh that you ran a hedge fund for a period of time you founded stock twits and then moved into venture but tell me you know i i think we we had some common in terms of the hedge fund business and all that, and then you diverged <clears> into to really venture and, and founding companies. Tell me about your investing background, because I, I, I don't know that I know the story, to be honest. Well, I think um, I'm not a classic investor. I went to ASU to just party, I guess, and get my green card. You know, I have this fantasy of living in Arizona. I grew up in Toronto. And uh, born in 1965, and so if you were born in Toronto, Jewish, upper middle class, 1965, you had a career path that was lawyer, doctor, accountant, dermatologist, um, or a furrier, maybe, okay. if you were an entrepreneur, <laughs> yeah, you know, or, or owned a deli uh, in Toronto. So entrepreneurship was not a thing in my coming of age okay. right the the kids that the kids that I hung out were were all going to be lawyers doctors accounts because that's what their parents were we grew up in a nice neighborhood and my peer group was fantastic uh, which probably shaped you know you know my whole life uh, the peer group made up for the flaws in everybody's family uh, but you know it's a fantastic peer group that I'm still you know run into and I'm friends with but the so I was destined to be a lawyer, doctor, accountant, and so for me that would only mean lawyer. Dropped out of, um, went to ASU to be a lawyer, okay. you know, to go into law school. Quickly flipped to an MBA because law, hundred degree, Arizona State weather, uh, and all these law books seemed like it was not going to be. I'm not going to be a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not that I'm. And if I was going to be a lawyer, I'd be a bad lawyer. Yeah. Right? I, 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 I honestly think you'd be a hell of a lawyer. I would lose a lot of cases. Yeah, I think you'd be a hell of a lawyer, but that's another story. We'll talk about it another I'd be, time. I'd be a rainmaker. Yes, exactly. For the yeah, law you'd be firm. a deal guy, litigator. But I would, I'd be the deal guy. So, um, but I hated the idea of the textbooks and this. Yep. And, and, and being a child of 1965 in Toronto, so when I was 15, um, that, that, was a, that was 1980. And 1980 Canada was... Comedians were the were the 
billion. Like they were the Jeff Bezos okay. or the you know Stanford engineers. So you had John Candy, you had Mike Myers, you had Second City Television, you had um, a Jim Carrey. Got you it. Had, you was know, John Candy Canadian? I don't know that Eugene I knew, I knew that one. Like, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. It was the best, the best. So you had everybody in the Jewish, everybody in the Jewish, every 15-year-old that's even non-Jewish, that Toronto, Canada was all about Second City okay. and they were our superstars. Oh, interesting. And, and, and so uh, the Great White North and hockey – and that's what a kid was before the internet. Um, and my and so I used to go to the comedy clubs. Uh, I became very good at uh, at a young age, uh, even though I wasn't funny to audiences. I, I had this whole network of comedians, and I would write, and that was my community. And so I never that was I was more a creative person, and that's not a fit in a world that you know your friends are all going to be doctors, lawyers, yeah, accountants. Yeah. So I, I ran I ran away to Arizona. Um, and so that's the long story. Love the weather. My, um, love the, the vibe of, of, uh, Arizona. We spent time there as a family on vacations and I just, that's where I was going. Um, and so I got into school, long story short, did the MBA and really, really the entrepreneurial spirit. It you know, hit me hard, um, right out of school. You know, I had to get my green card, uh, became a stockbroker just so okay. I could legally. If Gulf War, Gulf War had broken out. What, it was very. Was hard this to in get Arizona that you became a stockbroker? Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. I just pure curiosity. Did you submatriculate out of ASU undergrad into MBA? No, I went for the MBA. I done my undergrad in Canada. Oh, well, got it. You went to, to ASU for an MBA. For this. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, ASU not because it's a great school yeah. at the time, but also they had this. They had this deal with. Um, uh, Thunderbird, which yep. is a very famous international yep. school. So I did a dual MBA, but then it wasn't, they weren't handing out green cards post uh, Iraq war, uh, not post uh, Kuwait. Uh, no, Kuwait, yep. Kuwait war. And there was a major bank reset, major yep. US recession yep. in 1990. Real estate led. Arizona got hit pretty hard. Yeah, we had all the crime and, and the Keating family and the, and the SNL crisis. So that was how I came into the working world. And so I was like, looking in the newspaper, just begging for, for jobs, even with my master's degree and just settled on being a stockbroker, which, you know, didn't need to go have an MBA for cold calling people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that I got had, had And so I started out doing that in, you know, probably would have been very successful doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't that interested in the stock market. It was new to me. Okay. And I'm more, uh, I'm more creative and, and ended up uh, through a cold call backing a guy named Mark Scatterday. Long story short, we built um, a, a, uh, um, a company called The Grip. Uh, he had started it. I had cold called him. It was a stress ball. And we went on in my first company with him to be in the QVC Hall of Fame. Okay. And so the, so, oh, interesting. So, so right out of school, I had a home run. And, and it was me cold calling that led to that home run. Mark uh, built an incredible business with me. Um, and QVC, uh, people won't remember this, but this is like late, mid-90s. Crushing QVC it. was the internet. Crushed it. Well, they were the internet, yeah. right? The internet wasn't a thing yet. And so we thought, this is, this is again, this probably goes to today and AI and this combustion that we're seeing again, you know, we had QVC an hour before the internet, and meaning that was the greatest. If you got your product on QVC, yep. you yep. were going to become a million. You were going to become a millionaire, yep. right? And so everybody wanted to be on QVC, which was kind of like the equivalent of of like being a hot internet startup. And so we were lucky. We had a product called the Grip, and got it onto QVC, and it became a, what was, a top what selling was product. What was the product? Was it like a gripping tool? Or just or a stress it? ball. Stress ball. No, just okay. a stress ball. Okay, got it. Yeah, and we had high okay. margins. We sold tens of millions of them. And wow. We had a pet rock type yeah, yeah. Uh, thing, and uh, so so I learned every lesson about being an entrepreneur. <laughs> forgetting the MBA, that was my lesson, and because of that, I became a hedge fund because we were making so much money in the nineties, and our margins were so high that I was in charge of our cash. Ah. Very few businesses have this. Very few non-internet businesses have this problem, but we were making millions of dollars uh, a month selling stress balls to corporations. Okay. And because our margins were high and because, because we were getting paid before we delivered the product because we were putting corporate logos on them, we had cash. Okay. And my partner, 
and there's only so many things my partner could buy. It was an LLC. And so we were just started buying stocks. Hmm. And wow. that's how I learned the stock market, even though I had been a stockbroker. So now I was on the other side of the phone. Brokers were calling me. And it was fun. I was like fake Gordon Gecko. Right, right, right. right. And and it, the, our capital became enough that I said, I'm just going to do this full time because I loved it and dropped out of the, you know, managed the family money. It wasn't a lot. It was, you know, 10, 20 million bucks and a group of us. But, you know, that was my I did, really didn't know what I was doing, okay. but the people around me trusted me and I became a hedge fund kind of that way. Got it. And so what, what, uh, hated what, every minute of it for the next 10 years. What, yeah, hated what year did minute. you, like, I mean, did you eventually actually start a limited partnership, an LLC, limited partners? Yeah, so what, 98. What, 98 was the year you launched? Still launching. going today okay. because it has private companies in it and I haven't wound it down. Got it, got it. I've been able to wind it down, but uh, not taking in new capital, but closed it about 10 years ago. Okay. And there's still companies like eToro yeah, and StockTwits yeah. in there that I'd started so, and thrown in. So the the company had sidecars that are still running today. Got it, got it. And so I still I still have the joy headache uh, of of running K- a hedge K-1s. fund, even though I, it doesn't take new. I'm yeah. going to tell you the briefest story, which I think you know a bunch of this, but there, it's just funny because you and I have more intersections than I even knew. You know, I grew up a poor Mexican kid in Arizona, and all a poor Mexican kid wanted to be was not poor, uh, <laughs> you know. And so uh, I actually ended up – I think I have 22 credits from Arizona State that I got during high school, and then I got into Wharton undergrad, and they basically – I said, I got 22 credits. I could be like a sophomore or a junior. And they're like, nope, we're not going to take a single damn one of those. Um, but so I actually – I'm technically – I guess I'm not an Arizona State alumni uh, – because I didn't graduate with it, but it was uh, my first school. And uh, I actually started my first hedge fund or joined my first hedge fund in 97, 98. So we started, you know, I was, I was, on the, I was doing private equity actually in 95, 96 and, and then moved over. So, okay, so you have this hedge fund. Well, you came in from a way different, like you said, you came in, the, those are the kids hedge funds wanted. Yeah. No hedge fund was going to hire me. ASU. I had a, like I backed into it as the dummy, which led to all my success later well, because I was using Yahoo Finance. You were using Bloomberg. The, the funny thing so is, of course, I was a fake hedge fund. Like so. So again, I wasn't a hedge fund. So here's, I was an here, entrepreneur before the internet, and to be an entrepreneur before the internet, this goes back to the early story I told you. I wasn't a hedge fund. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I love the name, but if you were somewhat smart, and and it goes to a lot of all the why I'm a venture capitalist and why I think anybody can do whatever the hell they want from no matter what background they come. Yes, I was born on third base, so let's just get that out in the open. And not only was I born on third base, I had a peer group that was second to none. Right, right, right. Greatest, funnest, luckily neighborhood kids walk to school, no crime, um, no anti-Semitism. You know, there was stuff in Israel, but as a Jewish community in Toronto, I was sheltered very, very much. So it would be a shame if I wasn't successful. Like, I got to get that in the open. So I'm very proud that I didn't screw it up. The only thing I'm proud about is that I did not fucking drop the ball, right? Because I was born on third base. So, So that is... That was the only pressure probably I've ever had is like, how the fuck would you screw this up? up? So in my 30s, there was always that that risk of like, man, I'm underachieving based on how easy I had it. Now I feel like I can really give back. I I think you've more than caught up. (laughs) No, but I'm saying that was the only thing that drove me. Right. Was that I'd be embarrassed if I wasn't successful. And that was good enough. Listen, whatever it takes, if if that's what drove me, uh, you know, I'm over that now because at least I can say I, I carried the ball. I you know. And, I have a lot of Wharton you know. classmates that came from very wealthy backgrounds that were incredibly, incredibly driven. Um, well, I want to pick up the hedge fund story uh, and then move to stock twists. But I was share one last thing about our backgrounds is I came the, the I came the classic. I mean, well, there's a bunch of classic hedge fund routes. I came through one of the classic. Poor kid. I, I'm the, I, I was joking with you that I've got Wall Street on the background. You know, I was the Bud Fox version of getting into Wall Street, except a lot more legal. Um, you know, but in the last 20 years, 
I founded two hedge fund businesses, co-founded two other hedge fund businesses, and now have founded about like eight other businesses, including this business, HX Research. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had no – it wasn't that I had no interest or dislike of it. It just wasn't something I was like, I don't – I'm just going to start the business because I need the – I need to have it exist for me to do what I want to do. I never self-identified as an entrepreneur, but now I've ended up starting a dozen businesses in the in the same time. So so you ran the you ran the partnership and you've got 10, 20, 30, 50 million. I don't know what the number is, you know, and you said it was the worst 10 years of your life. So that let's 98 to 2008. What was the transition? What was the genesis of stock twits? And then what was the full transition over to private equity venture, et cetera? Um, yeah, I think it still goes back to the comedy days, right? You just seeing someone go on stage at that, at that formative age and kill it. You know, there was a club called Yuck Yucks, which was kind of like the improv of Canada. And by improv of Canada, I mean Yuck Yucks was, if you got on the stage of Yuck Yucks, it was like getting into YC, okay. right? Or Harvard, right? You Very hard to get on the stage in that era because Mike Myers, you know, Jim Carrey, Eugene, it was just fucking gold everywhere. And you knew it, like... Don't get me wrong. I would go on stage. People would heckle, and I wasn't very good. I didn't have anything. Right? Are, are there any Which videos could, of you on um, stage from back then? By the way, and not then. I, I, my friends swear that they're that they have pinged yuck yucks on Twitter a few times. Okay, okay. Um, but to go see Mike Myers or Jim Carrey at that age, and just I, I know, just like you would see an entrepreneur today, a Robin Hood, or any great company that we back, you some some of them you just know. To be at fifteen and go that fucking guy, to 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 know Mike Myers are going to be famous yeah, yeah, yeah. the minute you see him is the same as spotting an entrepreneur, or is the same as stop spotting a product. So at that formative age, sitting in an audience with four people on a Tuesday night watching Mike Myers or Jim Carrey. And also see them pack it in because people then be, and they're only 16 years old themselves. Yeah, oh, fascinating. Or, or, or a little older than me. And seeing Jim Carrey do Muppet voices and do the stuff, the contortions and go, and go just like you or I would see a great hedge fund or a yeah, great entrepreneur. Yeah. Guy. I can't, I'll, I'll never, or see Tiger Woods hit a golf ball. When I was watching Jim Carrey do comedy at Yuck Yucks or, or um, in on the park or some of the places he would show up in Toronto just to chase him down at 16 or 17 and go, that's like Tiger Woods. Right, right, right. So I got exposed to greatness without knowing it was greatness. And I got exposed to understanding curation and, and what talent was. So that all got put aside, go to school, hit my pet rock. Now I have money. Now I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to, I think, okay. be doing, being an entrepreneur, which before the internet is managing other people's money. Yep. Hey, I'm Jewish. People trust right. me. My partner trusts me. I, I founded um, a hedge fund in 2001. Idea, was doing the same thing. Like, But the idea of trying to beat up Benchmark was probably the dumbest choice that uh, my personality could make, meaning I'm a high achiever. I, I, I'm very anxious. I take things very personally. And I had no chance Got it. beating. So, so like, how dumb? And I didn't know enough about the market yeah, to, yeah, just yeah. Index, to, to just index. I was trying to beat the market. And, and I was trying to beat it with not institutional tools because, you know, I'm an ASU student. So I'm just beating it with brokers calling me. Not beating it, but, like, yeah, lucky it was a bubble and it. I was making money. But competing against it without knowing what I was competing against. So by, the, by 2004... I was like, you know, and you have the bear market in 2001, yep. two, three. By 2004, I'm like just the most miserable version of a Jim Cramer that you could be. It, it's, and, it is a hard um, emotional business. And if you are not either A, set up for it or trained for it, like meaning some people have the emotional – I, I, it's not until it's the emotional setup for it and other people have the training that, that, but if, if you're not, it's not fun. Like it's not a, it's not an enjoyable business a lot of the time. So – yeah, and I don't think emotionally I was very good at it. You know, for the, just anyways, if you could pick the wrong career for me, that was it. Um, so luckily um, for me, the Web two. I'm not a tech person, but Web two came out. And my office was right across from in Phoenix. Was right across as a hedge fund. My office was right across from one of the first Apple stores. Okay, and you know, in two thousand two thousand two two thousand three, the whole Wall Street, maybe still today, was driven by DOS and. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
you know, Microsoft yep. products. You had to use a Microsoft machine. And, I'm running, I'm and, running Microsoft on all my stuff right here, right now. So, you know, I'm old school. Yeah. And that also hated all that part as a, as just a creator slash just hated the whole world of DOS and Microsoft and windows. It just wasn't just, to, I'm not tech. I just, everything's felt clunky. And I walked into an Apple store in 2002 and my life changed because you weren't supposed to be able to be, Apple was failing. They were just launching the iPod. I stumbled into an Apple store. One of their first stores was at the Biltmore and I fucking felt like, oh my God, this is like, the future, huh. right? They had these you could touch. You could touch the product. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. grabbed an iPod, started spinning the wheel, and I bought one. And I bought a MacBook, or not a MacBook, but a, a Apple lap uh, desktop. Yep. You know, some and 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 I was like, okay, I, I went down a rabbit hole of Apple, and just Apple saved my life. I bought some stock, started riding that trend, and Apple was not popular, right? Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. It I was remember. Just, the iPod was its first hit. NVIDIA was very similar to Apple. NVIDIA was a also ran video game chip company that like, it's like, oh yeah, they make chips. Sure. They make chips for, the for, for pay, PlayStations. Yeah. Like, Gamer. you know, it's, it's for gamers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was also a very kind of like th- a throwaway tech company, but not certainly one of the leaders. Anyways, it's funny when you say that about Apple. So I got stumbled in there. Um, it really changed my life in the sense that it broke me out. It got my curiosity. Go. Apple was the first computer company that let you play with stuff. Okay. You know, it comes on the heel of Dell and and going to Costco to get a Packard Bell. Yep. And, and Apple was supposed to fail. You don't open, Gateway had just failed with their retail stores. People don't realize this. Apple was doomed. And, and opening a retail store to sell computers? Oh, wait a minute, not sell computers, sell music machines right, that only right, store right. 100 songs? Like if you, could, if you could read the headlines of how Apple was like gonna fail, but I just saw it. That was my first like aha moment in tech. And it didn't matter what anybody was saying. I saw, kept seeing the iPods and the, and the headphone, you know, the white cords everywhere. And look, I got a white cord now. Um, I probably don't need it. But uh, the it was an epiphany because now I was like Peter Lynch, I guess, okay. or, you know, someone who didn't have to stare at a screen and do that. And I've ridden Apple pretty much since then. It's only gotten better. Um, and so that was my first discovery of like, okay, you can invest without trading Got it. and you could really understand the story. And I saw a catalyst before other people saw a catalyst. So in a way I was, a, I was a venture capitalist, even though the stock was public, Okay, right? Because stock was not, it was cheap. Um, and, um, wasn't in an upward trend, but then I started fitting it in with my own strategy. So anyways, Apple kind of saved me. And then in 06, the next big aha moment was YouTube, right? And I'm, I'm farting around as a creative person. And um, I see YouTube and I had an idea. I was going to build CNBC, which was the product yep. as a hedge fund you watched all day, which I hated. You know, I found myself in a room talking to the, t- whenever I wasn't at the Apple store, I found myself in my room. Yelling at, or yelling at Mark Haynes. You know. Talking. Yeah, talking to Mark Haynes, talking to Mark Haynes, and um, my son is here. Talking to Mark Mark Haynes, who was the only good person. Yeah, yeah, on Mark, that show, Mark was a wonderful human being. And, and Jim O'Shaughnessy, yeah. who I'm friends with. Um, but I found myself going, who are these, these idiots? And um, so my epiphany was seeing YouTube, and it was all cat videos at the time, and it wasn't even for sure that YouTube was going to win. But I was w- looking at YouTube going, wait a minute, why don't I create – like Second City. Huh. So now the all the training I had in my past, yeah, yeah, like yeah, being yeah. a stand-up, watching Second City television. Second City television was a spoof of a cable network in Toronto. Right. Uh, and John Candy, Eugene Levy, Flaherty, Dave Thomas, Rick Moranis, they were actors in a fake cable show. Okay. And so I said, why don't we create a show of CNBC on YouTube right. inspired by what I had learned. And I cold called Fred Wilson, who's like, you know, the best investor in the world probably. And he had backed to street.com, a product that I use. And I was a big fan of Jim Cramer. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I, I was the 30 second, Fred, 30 second subscriber at the street.com, by the way. And I only know that because the CFO was the wife of a classmate of mine. And I knew I was a very early subscriber. And I was like, do you have a list? And she's like, yeah, you were like, you know, in the top 50, just randomly. I just happened to be like, you know, 
uh, didn't, yeah, so didn't know anyone there. One of the luckiest, me too. I loved the street at the time. The street was the, the street was like the non hedge fund yeah, way. Yeah, that's how I met it her. Made retail, it, yeah, exactly. Me too. So it made retail feel like they were at least not getting, at least had a voice. Yeah. That was early Kramer. He was a great entrepreneur at the time um, and inspired me to try this idea. And I created this show on YouTube called Wall Strip. Yeah. And Fred Wilson and a bunch of really good people were my investors. And we put together this ridiculously funny um, second city of Wall Street. Okay. That was my pitch to Fred Wilson. And uh, he invested. Does Fred happen to be Canadian, by the way? Because I'm not familiar with Second City. Yeah. I, I, I think I've heard of it, but like, you know. Yeah, if you go look up YouTube Second City, yeah, yeah. it's called SCTV. Yeah. And oh, just, I, SCTV. It was Saturday I Night Live. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was Saturday Night Live before Saturday got Night Live. And it. there was also John Biner had a great show. Canada had all the, uh, Canada was way funny okay. at okay. that time. And we were really proud of right. it as Canadians. Right, right, right. I was like, you know. So, you know, there is Second City Chicago, which America is very that proud I'm familiar of. That I'm with. Yep. Yeah. But relatively to the size of Canada and what we've contributed to arts, Second City was the fucking shit. And these people were national heroes. So to be able to produce that in with but a stock market, you know, we were going to create CNBC as a fucked up cable network. Okay. And so it started as a three minute show a day that I wrote. And within six months, CBS bought the show. I, so, I remember a so little my bit about show, this. Yeah. So, that, so that is my biggest claim to fame, other than the cash tag, is my stupid spoof beginning of creating CNBC on YouTube in 2006 was acquired by CBS okay. for a lot of money after just six months. And just, I was in the right place at the right yeah. time. I didn't have any revenue. It was just, oh, so it was just kind of like Larry David. I was just stumbling, bumbling, didn't know any idea of what I was doing. But the Internet created magic. And I happened to be in Les Moonves's offices within six months of starting my show with no media background. That's amazing. And now I'm an Internet celebrity. And by the way, Internet celebrity back then, I, my YouTube shows... A great show would get four thousand views. Right, right, right. Like, a, like, like a viral episode was four thousand. Do, do you remember views. Sportsline, which became CBS sure. Sportsline? We actually worked on sure. the deal at Lehman before CBS got involved. So, like, CBS actually used to way back in the day. I mean, it's like a lot of legacy media. They bought a lot of shit and just drove it into the ground. Okay, so so you sell that to CBS, and then where did stock twits come from? Structures came, so I sell, I'm working at CBS, I'm basically Clarence Beaks of CBS. I hated my job with it. They hated me, yeah. I hated them. Uh, it was <laughs> hate at first what sight. you would expect. Right. From, hate at first sight, meaning they didn't allow me to do anything I wanted to do. Like once they had me, it's like, no, we can't, you know, they're crossing. I go, it's an internet show, no one's watching. Um, so there was no, it was a mess from day one, but they paid me. And then Twitter comes out. Remember, this is pre-iPhone, so yep, it was yep. a BlackBerry. And so I wasn't. I thought Twitter was really dumb. Fred Wilson, who was my investor at Wall Street, shows me Twitter. He says, "Do you want to invest?" And I say, as, "You know." And by and by this time, I I felt I was in the in crowd. Okay. So I had my little CBS. I had my own little CBS. I, I mean, you're talking to you Fred know, cool Wilson. That's pretty in crowd, if you ask me. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it's the innest of the in yeah. crowd. And, and I had just made Fred money, and his wife loved me because um, she was, you know, it was a personal investment, and she's lovely. And so now they're showing me deals, and I don't have that kind of money. So I'm just. 25. Anything Fred shows me, I'm like 25K. I'm not even doing the research. Yeah, I'm just yeah, like, yeah. I'm in the group. we got to write 25K checks. And I think the first three I wrote were like really bad, even though, you know, but I would just, you have to write checks. Yep, like, yep. I don't know what the rules are. So, um, so I wrote some checks and they weren't working, you know, because feces are wrong too. And um, even the best in the world. Then he, then Twitter, he, he wins, it's his first West Coast win. He wins the Twitter deal. Um, and the deal is three on 17. Got to understand that at the time when we were doing seed deals, they were like one on three. Yeah. Uh, just for, just know, for my 25%. listeners, just so you know what that means, that means a million on a $3 million valuation. Three million. Yeah. yeah. Like today yeah. it's ridiculous, but like back then it was like value. Or, you know, yeah, even though it was risky, but it seems now, now a million like on value. three is like so, the legal fees for a lot of these deals. But anyways, 
Yeah, the world's lost its mind. So, so I just I'm talking like an old man to your listeners now. When I was a cook at VC in the early 2000s, my, my, my listeners are uh, broad next. Some of them are, are are probably more our epoch than. Uh, yeah, than I can than only tell my world. story, unfortunately, but. I do have some history here because, you know, the internet, I was doing deals right at the beginning randomly. So Fred pitches me. So Fred knows I'm, I, I'm making fun of Twitter. And so, so what happens with Twitter? It, it comes out. It really takes off. Yep. Right. For, again, this is network effects before real network yeah, yeah, yeah. effects. Remember, the internet wasn't where we didn't have the smartphone yet. This was a BlackBerry internet, right? Like it's the first mobile internet, right? We thought BlackBerry was the shit. I, I, I and, must have had eight different Blackberries, every, every one. I, I went up yeah. to Canada multiple so, times, was involved in research and motion, the stock for a decade. So, so you got to understand, like, and, and our most popular Wall Strip show was me. It was very funny. It was me, Roger Ehrenberg, Fred Wilson, Bijan Sabat, legends of venture capital now, like billions made, having a BlackBerry Olympics. Right, right. So like, <laughs> one of my first shows was like, and it was very inside joke, yeah, yeah. but to get those legends yeah. against me doing weird stunts using their BlackBerry, and it was like a very funny show that went very, again, viral amongst the right people. Right, right, right. So... There's viral where like Mr. Beast and everybody watches. And then there's viral me and Fred Wilson and Roger Ehrenberg doing really silly things. And the 5,000 people that need to watch it yep. all yeah, watched yeah. it and were jealous. You know what I mean? So so that's the wiring that I understood. Anyway, so so Fred and I are, are blackberrying with our Twitter and Fred goes, you should invest. And he's and I said, hey, I'm in. Like, I, I can't afford to be in anymore at this point. Um and he sends me the term sheet, and it's three on seventeen. Okay. So, so imagine my surprise. I'm used to doing like one on three. You know. So I, I yeah. So I call Fred. I go, this is fucking stupid. Like, how am I going to make money if you price this thing at seventeen million? You know. I start yelling at Fred. Like, what do you know about the business? You know, <laughs> just complete asshole. And um, Fred goes, okay. Like, you know. Um, don't invest. He's not going to talk. <laughs> yeah, he's not <laughs> just trying to talk me. He he was just sending it around, and that's how deals got done. Then you were in, yeah, yeah. And, and if you get a headache, you're yeah. out. And it was the angel list before angel list. Fred had a list, so I was on the list, and I I said no. I said good fucking luck. How much? Like this would have to be worth three hundred million <laughs> for this to make sense to me. <laughs> uh, and here's why. It's funny because I didn't understand anything about venture capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understood enough. To, the internet was just getting. Started. I knew nothing about what network effects were. Think about how so, dumb. So that did you? But I forget. Is. Did you make? People, did you end up making up the Twitter me. investment? You. I made up getting very lucky and getting a lot of stock by making other investments that Twitter bought. Ah, got it. Got yeah. it. Okay, I remember the story yeah, now. I remember the story now. So, so what's so funny is people look. No one asks real questions like. This story is funny because it's just a reminder of all these people that brag about how smart they are, why we make fun of people like me and Kramer and Chamath. <laughs> the internet, man. It was the internet. It's... If you didn't make money in the – I didn't even know, understand the scale and I made money. The internet scale – and, you know, think about YouTube then. They had 100 competitors. Yep. You know, it was all cat videos. If you think about Mr. Beast today, it's just I, no one thought there would be a Mr. Beast. Like, I, I, I thought posted, people thought I was a hero for, for selling a show to CBS. Yeah, I posted to Twitter today because uh, I just it just came across my my I don't know I just found found it that uh, a new an article from NBC News in 2007 where Google bought Twitter for 1.56 billion dollars and I was just like just a reminder that Google bought Twitter so let's do this Wait, well, YouTube YouTube I'm sorry YouTube. YouTube oh sorry sorry YouTube is what I what I was trying to say YouTube. but my because you, yeah, you kept on saying Mr. Beast and I have YouTube on the brain um, but yeah it's it's a crazy number what so and then finally where where did stock twits come into this because you that you know how Twitter Anyway, so I, 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 so I'm just so, so Fred and I, Fred knew I got it. Yeah. So one day I sent Fred, uh, and I didn't invest, right? And, you know, whatever. And now I'm mad at myself because I'm, I'm like trying to figure out how, because I'm the guy using it. And yeah. so my, the reason I was using Twitter, because I didn't, there's nobody on it. It was, it was viral for what viral was in 07. Right, right, right. But it was still like 
people, everybody on it was making, it's the same on Twitter today as it was then. Everybody on Twitter in 2007 was like, this is the stupidest thing ever. Yeah. So, yeah, so are. now they say Elon sucks. Yeah. Back then it was like, this, this sucks. is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we said to each other, but we were using it all day. Yeah. And so my shtick was, I would tell people where I was going to the back, because it was a very inside crew of fuddy-duddy VCs using it and Silicon Valley elites. And I was the goofball. So I would say, hey, I'm taking a shit in New York, you know, at this restaurant. It's a really good toilet, right? I can you imagine Fred Wilson opening that up <laughs> and laughing? Like, Fred loved the whole, he loved the way I used Twitter, right? Because it was just, he likes, he understood Twitter was not just a protocol. Right, he right, knew right. it was going to be the way people, and I was just using it the way most people use it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is taking, I'm taking a shit, dumb, except dumb, it's here. It, this, stuff, yeah. Today, it's, I hate uh, Palestine, or I hate Israel, or Harvard, or, you know what I mean? So it's, nothing's changed. It's just the scale has changed. So, so I came to Fred, and I said, Fred, wouldn't it be great? Because BlackBerry had a pin, right? The greatest thing for brokers back, yep. you know, it's a hedge fund guy. BlackBerry's thing was, there was a pin. Everybody had a unique number. And the brokers were the first people to figure out, I could talk about stocks, Without, with going around the firewall of my brokerage and my hedge fund using a pin. So that was like inside information was being can, can I take the Can I take the other side the of that, though? Because we use that all day long. Mm-hmm. I, no one I know who used it was worried about inside information or going around the firewall. It was just a chat. So I remember going all the way back using Yahoo Chat or actually what was the Israeli company that uh, – that was. ICQ. ICQ. I remember using ICQ ICQ back in the day. And then the first time we had chat on phone was through BlackBerry. So that was like, Mm -hmm. I don't think it was an inside info. Being being on the other side. No, I I say that is like. No, I know you're trying to be funny. As a guy who wasn't in the business, I assume it was all being Yeah, but it was was revolutionary because we could now be like you use your phone today. One to one, peer to peer. Yep, peer to peer. Peer-to-peer, non around the firewall, and also very secure. Yeah, right. And BlackBerry was amazing. Obama had a BlackBerry company, apparently. You know, I'm saying it was very more secure than the iPhone. So if you use the pin, sorry, if you use the pin. Anyways, I so I not a hedge fund guy. So when Twitter came out, it was the same thing except public. Yeah. So I sent Fred a text on my BlackBerry one day saying, "I'm buying Rim dollar sign R I M M." That was the first, I think, cash tag. Okay. I'm sh- anyway, Fred sent me back a thing. This is fucking so genius. That's what he sent me back. You should start a company, right? And I said, I'm going to start a company. Like, I, I'm still working at CBS. Right, right, right. You still have and a CBS job goes, doing all this? Like, I, I, I still have this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, of course. I was, I was like I said, like, CBS was I didn't have a job. Yeah, like, yeah. I was Clarence Speaks. They paid me and I didn't really work. So I was just farting around. And and um, he goes, you got to start a company. I said, Fred, well, why doesn't Twitter just, you know, copy this? this you know, they, they could, I'll give it to them, you know. And Fred sets up a meeting with Ev and Jack who are, you know, fighting right from the beginning. Yeah. The company's blowing up. There's power struggles right from the beginning. I thought they were knuckleheads. Everybody thinks everybody's a knucklehead, by the way. So I, I assume that. I don't think everybody. you're a knucklehead. I really felt, at least not your I face. really felt they were yeah, knuckleheads. Yeah, yeah. I really felt they were knuckleheads because they missed, they weren't understanding the power of their own product. Right. Right. Like they were, it was all VCs. And I'm like, guys, this is going to, the president's going to tweet from here one day and the market's going to move. Right. That was literally my pitch. Yeah, yeah, Fred yeah. got it. Fred's like, you got to go meet Jack and Ev. So I, I sit down with Jack and Ev and I'm like, show them you know, the dollar sign. And there was already the hashtag, okay. right? Yeah. And the reason I came up with the cash tag was the hashtag was if I go hashtag AAPL yep. or hashtag APPLE and then searched, it was like a fucking, I went to the market to buy a green apple. Uh, I hate apples. Yeah. Yep. Uh, or it's talking about occasional the corporation, about not apple. the stock. Yeah. We were, we were talking, we have a yeah. whole internal conversation because I have some people who yeah. didn't come from Wall Street and I was explaining the cash tag to them. And I was like, this is what, yeah. this is why this exists. This is, how, this is why Fred is so great. He understood by that one dollar sign rim and being able – now you had context. Right, to right, the, right. So my, my cash tag was a hashtag with context. Yep, yep. That's what Fred understood, right? And I, obviously, I understood it because I was trying to come up with a way to, like, search other people. You know, yeah, talking you know, about throwing, See if we could organize. Yep. So I was a giveaway to 
Twitter. I was just giving that away like the hashtag was. Like I had no control over it. I was just like, and uh, you know, and Fred started talk Fred liked stocks, right? He was he was an investor in the street.com. So 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 he understood it right away. He goes, You gotta meet Jack and Evan. I go to meet Jack and Evan. It was like talking to a wall. Okay. I was like, guys, you're sitting on Bloomberg. This is fucking yeah, yeah, Bloomberg, yeah. right? This is how I talk to everybody. I just walk in there and I'm just giving them for free. Like, and you got to imagine everybody's telling them they're idiots or everybody's giving them a business idea for Twitter yeah. at the time is scaling up. There's still no iPhone. Wow. And, and I'm like showing them this and I'm saying, guys, why don't you do this? Okay. I used to be on Yahoo. Fin I'm trying to tell them the story that I would tell everybody. I used to be on Yahoo Finance in 1999 and think I had inside information on 20 minute delayed yeah, yeah, quotes. Yeah. That's how dumb I was. I, but you might have, actually, in 1999, you might have, by the way. But anyway. You made money. <laughs> you could make money for a yeah. while with 20 minute delayed quotes. Yeah. People do not understand that. Okay. So they took 20 minutes and made it zero fucking latency. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, to the public. They were sitting on a gold mine. And so I walked in there with the pitch and I was like, sure, they were going to just take it. I said, why don't you start twitter.finance.com? Okay. Like Yahoo Finance yeah. and yeah, disrupt yeah. you and you and you have chat. So you've already won. And then you go get charting and this and the dollar sign this. I'm giving them the whole vision that exists today. Yeah. And they're looking at me and they just, why don't you do it? Okay. And I said, guys, all you have to do is delay the stream 30 seconds. Right. And everybody that wants real time information will see the latency. Your phone will ring off the hook, Goldman, and they will pay you for the real, real time. Right, 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 right. right. You do. Like if Kim Kardashian takes a shit in the middle of Times Square, if her if the world knows about it in real time or a minute later, it means nothing. Therefore, you can delay her a minute. Right, right. But if the president or the plane lands on the Hudson, or eventually Saddam, or we kill uh, who's, uh, Osama, Osama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we use the futures. And the people who need that information in real time will pay you billions of dollars. Although the and sustainability so that was, of that Fred, idea, I would have questioned, right? Like, because if it works, it's going to definitely not with network itself. effects. Yeah. No, with network effects. Yeah. So again, I'm just telling you, at least I was in the room yeah, pitching yeah, yeah, this idea. Course in 2007 and they laughed me out of the room basically and went on to be a 44 billion dollar company right, right. i started stock twits basically to say just to show them what to do okay and here i am 18 years later old aggravated <laughs> grumpy uh i think you were i think you were aggravated and grumpy and 18 I years ago too. by the way <laughs> i don't know that that's yeah. changed but I, here's the thing of of all the money and all the success, it's still my favorite. The misses are still my favorite stories because right. I was there yeah, yeah. Like, like a comedian and they looked at me with a look of such disdain. <laughs> like you got to understand, Jack and Ev looked at me with so much disdain too, which is funny. Did, I just think was that's it, Was it disdain or dismissal? I was in the room. You know, because they can be two different things. Oh, because they were geeks, yeah, and yeah. I was coming in to tell them what to do with such confidence and such conviction. They weren't even listening. So, you know what I mean? Fred, but I had so much confidence because Fred fucking Wilson was sending me in on a mission yeah, yeah. to tell them what to do. Because yeah. you know, Fred was... Fred believed it, like Fred. It's like having Chuck, you know, Fred was it's on like the having board. Chuck Norris send you in, like you know you're you know. Yeah. You're, so let me this let me ask you this. Howard, you, by the way, I was mad at Fred. I go, Fred, these guys are fucking dicks, tremendous dolts. <laughs> yeah, I just said they're fucking dolts, yeah. and so, so they're billionaires. So, this goes to the internet. Anybody could be a billionaire. So let's let's go to this. Like so now I'm gonna I'm gonna skip all the way. That that's great because I didn't know the background, but it's a, you your career has been mixed with entrepreneurship. It's always been a kind of or, or very quickly around stocks. You've never necessarily been a stock guy, but it's always been a thread through it. And now you're back at stock twits again. So I'm going to ask you two two groups of questions here. And this is very salient for my for my listeners. Number one is as you sit there in stock twits today, what is what is kind of the vision like? What how are you thinking about it? Like you know, because you were there when you started, and now you're there. But then number two, and this kind of mixes in with that. You know, you, you've had a lot of successful investing, uh, a lot of things that most people won't ever get to do. On you know, the entrepreneurship. Look, there's a lot of people that are entrepreneurs. They start a, uh, a an auto repair company, which is a great fucking business if you if you run it right and all that. 
But, you know, as you sit also on top of the Stock Twits community or you've, you've been a part of that, you know, I'd love to hear what the vision is for Stock Twits. And then if you were to take two, three things that you look at investing and your your cousin from Toronto comes and visits you and other than throw all mm-hmm. your money in an index fund, which is what everyone always says, if you had to pick two or three mm-hmm. things for public market investors, what would you pick? So tell us about stock twits and, and your, you know, your three public takeaways. If you gun to your head, you had to do them. Yeah, good question. So I do believe in indexing. I hate saying it, but no, no, uh, I do. It's a great so way of term. So therefore, if I'm going to index, is there a better way to index? So I'm very fascinated with direct index. We invest in a company called Freck.com, F-R-E-C.com, okay. which is Robin Hood of direct indexing. Meaning, instead of picking stocks, shouldn't you start with an index that you know is an easier way to do it? And maybe unpick one. Okay. So I believe in this idea of unpicking. So if you're going to ask me about a trend, I believe in... They're kind of tied together. I believe in, if you're going to index, direct index, because there's tax benefits to this fucking, like, indexing with a tax benefit is, sign me up. What, what okay? is direct So anybody, direct who's, direct anybody who's buying SPY or, or XLK and not doing it through a direct indexing platform is losing 1% to 3% a year in tax benefits from tax loss harvesting. Got it. Right. So this is automatic tax loss harvesting. Can I, I, and I, I'm a everybody. stock guy, less, less about indexing and stuff like that. But, but what does direct indexing mean? I don't, I don't think I actually know. I'll admit that. I don't. It's just a terrible, like no different than Bitcoin, terrible marketing. But it's basically a loophole in tax loss, har- using machines in, in tax loss harvesting Got it. to to swap out of stocks that go down a certain. Everybody has different okay. kind okay. of um, methods of direct indexing, okay. but it's a very computer generated way to lock in losses okay. uh, quickly and and buy the stocks back after 30 days but substitute into alternatives using computers and and algorithms okay and offered offered by the gold if you have a cl- uh, uh, an account at Goldman yeah. and you're rich they, they there's big companies that offer I've, direct I've heard of this this okay. so so Freck is a guy is an engineer from Twitter who made a lot of money and was indexing and knew about tax loss harvesting okay. and he built a product for his own money right cuz he's is I wouldn't say cheap but he's yeah. frugal yeah and he saw as an engineer, and so uh, working with Ape, on top of Apex, which is pretty shitty, but Apex is still like the we, we're investors in Alpaca, which is a competitor to to Apex. But Apex is the old school back end brokerage in a box, um, and so he built uh, a system on top of it. It is a beautiful uh, direct indexing product. So for fifty grand, you can be direct indexed. Okay. So so that's a trend that I'm bullish on. So I, I'm going to tell um, you something, Howard. Trend. I'm actually going to write this up in my daily my daily newsletter because because uh, because we, we you should interview. Yeah, him. yeah well, I'd love to. I'd love to because we talk about like look, I talk about all kinds of things with the markets. Like my paid products are here's an idea, buy this either as a trade yeah. or that. But you but should I, always I about, try and do that. Yeah. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna I you will. You should always do what you're doing. I will, I will investigate I will into this myself and. And, uh, yeah, so direct indexing is for the mass. Okay. And the second thing that comes with direct indexing, which is genius. Again, it's not a word. I call it stock unpicking. Okay. Meaning, I love the S&P. It works for people that want asset allocation. I love the QQQ. Been long, you know, that's QQQ over SPY. That's been my theme for 10 years. But I also hate certain companies okay. within those indexes. Meaning, so wouldn't it be great to just, instead of ESG and MSG and blah, 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 and listening to talking heads, wouldn't it be best to get my kicks by buying the S&P on Freck and just taking off one stock a year? Okay. It could be Apple. It could be Wells Fargo. It could be an oil company. So you get to at least pick a stock without wrecking the returns of, you know, you, so you can kind of closet index and still be stock Who picking. picks the stock? So I love that idea. You can. You can go deselect a stock. So okay. instead of picking a stock, you can. So when you sign up for Freck and the S&P, you can actually redu- take out one of the Got stocks. It. Got because it. part of direct indexing that became, why direct indexing became big is people at Google with billions of dollars worth of Google shares, when they went to index, yeah, they pull out the, the Google the 6% Google. of the index. Yeah. So they would take, so they would direct index, meaning they would give you the S&P without Google. Doesn't Jeremy... Now it's available to everybody. Yeah, Jeremy Siegel had had a whole thing with what, what basically smart indexing, which is, you yeah. know, we'll we'll put, a, put together a rules-based system where we'll do 90% of the index 
and, you know, underweight this 10 percent and that 10 percent. But this is actually eliminating a stock. This allows everybody to do it themselves. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, that's this fascinating. Still, okay. So simple. Still at Freck. Fascinating. This is. So I call it okay. Freck.com. Okay. So when you sign up, you can unpick. It's fucking cool. So for, first piece and of, so you're first still piece picking of stocks. guidance. And this is very different than most people. We're going to check out Freck.com and write it up. What would be other, two other things you would, you, would, you would lend to someone or say to someone to, to think about? Okay. So data, when I started StockTwits, the first person, and we're running over, when I started StockTwits, I did, I'm not a hedge fund guy. I'm not a data guy. But um, my friend Matt Ober is now my partner. He was running data at WorldQuant. He was uh, mm-hmm. uh, one of the many running data at WorldQuant. He knocked on my door in 2010 and said, we're going to pay you for StockTwits' API. Okay. I didn't even know what this was. Yep. And he said, we're going to pay you money. And I was like, what? You're going to pay me for my like nonsensical stream of, of people chatting about stocks? And he was ripping me off because he was so ahead of the curve. But I was like, you're going to pay me 10 grand a month for nothing? <laughs> and I'll, I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. And he probably would have paid 30 grand a month. But anyways, it was a rare data set of, of people doing yep. a very you know, unique thing. So coming back full circle, you know, in 2023... No one had heard of ChatGPT. Okay. So let's let's be honest about, and I don't even really use ChatGPT, but I'm saying in 2000, November of 2022, we went from zero users of AI, yep. basically as a service, to what, hundreds of millions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, in, in the course of six months, that's a big boom effect, right? That's bigger than the YouTube effect did on web it's the fastest, now, the fastest unlike, uptake ever. Unlike, yeah, so unlike YouTube, AI doesn't speak to me. So I'm an old man. AI doesn't speak to me like YouTube spoke to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Right? So so I don't have the same advantages anymore because I'm not in, I don't like computers. Yep. I don't like machines. I like this. I like face-to-face. I like the media. So I'm an old fart in the AI business. So so AI and what AI proves, it's, it's a benefactor to the incumbents, right? So in a centralized world that we exist right now, and this is why crypto's having a second boom, you know, people it's a very obvious, is that this is this is crypto's real chance to fight against the machines. Okay. Right? Because the internet was won by the Fang and by the Magnificent Seven, AI only because of the amount of capital you have to put in, right? Yes, NVIDIA is great, but guess who's NVIDIA great because? Because the Mag Seven are fucking cheating and rolling each other up and doing aqua hires and using their power of money to control the LLM. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so the other thing is small is now cool again, meaning they're up here fighting interplanetary wars. So I'm not as interested anymore in Fang and the Magnificent Seven. God bless them. They're they're animals. They're fighting in a scale like Empire Strike. We can't stop them. Yeah. They can only, they can only kill themselves. Okay. The government can't stop them. Uh, the only thing that can stop them is blockchains, right? Okay. And everybody should. So the second thing is read Chris Dixon's book. I don't have it out. Okay. Everybody should read Chris Dixon's book. Um, that is a free tip. And I'm not a book reader. The last book I read was Phil Knight's Shoe Dog. Read, I'm reading write, Chris Dixon's own, NLP. building the next era yeah. of the internet. Is that the book? You will. You, it's the best advice that I could give anybody okay. who's a disbeliever or thinks they're too late to AI and crypto. Okay. You're just beginning. Okay. And, I, and I say that as a non-user and a skeptic yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because I'm not a tech guy. And, and, but the way he finally explains blockchains and the own okay. web, I, listen, it's not, it's not going to be bigger than AI or the web, but it's truly for people like us who want to build community and don't want to get fucked by the man. Um, so we're, we, we're never going to have another Mr. Beast on YouTube. Yep. We're going to have millions of little Mr. Beasts in Somewhere the else. blockchain yeah, world. Yeah. Okay. And that's better. So I'm going to so, 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 buy the so book. I'm going to buy the book. That'll be the epiphany. Yeah, give it away to anybody you like. Give it away to all your employees. It'll, it'll, it'll wake you up. And Chris is one of the best investors of all time. He's a lovely guy. Well, uh, again, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to read it. He's an LP it. in my fund. I'm going to read it, and I'm actually going to review it also in another HX Daily because I, I, I like share this out. Yeah. So the third one. I'm trying to get him on my podcast. What's, what's your third piece of advice? The third piece of advice is if you're going to pick stocks, uh-huh. and I think everybody should because it's just maybe the greatest game in the world. I agree with that. Okay, so – so if you're not picking stocks, you're not living the life of an American. Right? 
because you can be wrong, you can cut yourself, you can you can make yourself. Ma- it, nothing makes you feel smarter or dumber than picking. But, stocks. By the so way, there are more Indian, to have there are more feeling. Indian stock traders than there are American ones. Yeah. So. <laughs> absolutely. And, and stock yeah. trust has got a good. Uh, yeah, I know. Stock trust India is, is growing Indian very business. nicely. So you asked me when my strategy stock trust India is is a big strategy. Yeah. Um, so quickly, so the third thing advice I give you, definitely pick stocks. Okay. Definitely pay people like you or me, if or whoever, it's free, not free. Find mentors. Yeah, yeah. There's a stigma. There's a stigma that if you're paying somebody, why aren't they rich? Right. I mean, is my psychiatrist richer than me? No. Is my guitar teacher richer than me? Is my golf instructor richer than me? There's a stigma that, oh, if I'm buying ideas from someone who's not rich, I'm an idiot. No. Some people are just good at reading the tape and, and being educated. And, and, Some people and are really good at, at, at being great at making money. There's another element but to ideas it. ideas are things you pay for. Yeah, there's another element ideas to it. Ideas you should pay yeah, for. Yeah, there's another element to it. I, had, I was doing a podcast earlier with someone else. You know, look, I when I joined Whitney to, to form Empire, our idea was to take the access and the research and the stuff that we did for, for with billions of dollars. Uh, I, and I think I've run more money than any newsletter writer out there, you know, personally, because I ran literally billions of dollars. The idea was to take that access and put it in real language for real people. And I got to be honest with you, I could walk away tomorrow and go get a seven figure job at a hedge fund. But like you, like, I don't want to do that. This is actually much more interesting. I interact with my people all the time. I have received at, at Empire here hundreds and probably over a thousand letters, emails from folks saying, thank you. You helped me do this, that, whatever it was. And I got to tell you, making money for UAE or CalPERS or the Common Fund, it's great. and You get paid. This is a lot more interesting. And, and to be honest, you know, I'm like you. I've, I've, I've done, I've formed a dozen companies. I've founded four hedge funds. Been there, done that. I kind of want to do things to me that feel more meaningful. Um, you know, I want my kids to be proud of me. And if I start another hedge fund, grow it to a billion bucks, like, you know, my kid's more interested in my YouTube channel, to be honest. So uh, I like that. I like that. Pick stocks. So we're going to we're going to check out Freck. Uh, we're going to read the book and and get involved in the stock market and, and engaged. Well, let's let's do this. Yeah. Uh, and be nice. I think I think the other counter trend I did is be fucking nice. Yeah, Come to stock to say hello. You're not going to get you're not going to go to Twitter and get what you want by being a prick. Uh, it may relieve some stress. You're not going to get what you want on stock just by saying everybody is a troll. I think you, it is. It's the free Internet. Social, the free Internet is messy. Social media is an amplified mirror. Whatever you bring to it, you're yeah. going to get back in spades. Yeah. My feed but, on, on Twitter but is it, awesome, nice. is great, is super, super friendly, is super engaging. You know, I actually, everyone that follows me now, I actually go in and send them a personal message saying, hey, I appreciate you following me. Like, there's, you know, it, it's be, being nice and doing good things still works. So let's do this. Yeah. And then the last, the last thing quickly yeah, of is everywhere. Microsoft's, if you really, there's a great article, I'll link to it tomorrow, a great article by Jeff Brown. He's a, he's a really good tech newsletter. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm I don't familiar know how Jeff. I stumbled upon him. Anyways, he wrote a piece the other day about Microsoft's AI. This is where it goes to AI. It's very frustrating, but I'm okay. I'm at peace with AI because I don't need it. I'm, I'm a good writer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know how to write myself. I don't need anybody reading my materials. I know how to write a newsletter. I'm in the, I'm in the lucky ones that got that got left brain or right, whatever you yeah. call creative brain, I don't need it. For my son, AI is brilliant because he can't put together three sentences oh, even though he's a college student because he's not his 80, whatever the problem is with his brain is, it wasn't built for the world that existed before AI. Yeah. But AI is a fucking godsend for people like my son who, who, sp- who can't do spell check and can't put five ideas together and write an essay. Right, right, right. Isn't that great that AI can do that for him and, and can put him in the business world and can he can run his email before it gets to a, a customer and it now has grammatically correct? Yep, yep. I mean, this is AI is fantastic for the people that were left behind by the machine generation. Interesting. So God bless Facebook, Amazon. Let them make their trillions of dollars. And you can fight that. Or you can do what Chris Dixon and people like me are saying. Maybe there is something to a decentralized blockchain network. And yes, I won't be the next Fang stock, but I will be the most happy 
you know, millionaire Look. or thousandaire that I can be. And that's the way the world, if you don't understand that that's the world that we live in, you're going to be very frustrated you, you for the next you, hundred you, years. You can't fight the ocean and it's a lot more fun to surf the waves, you know, is my, yeah. is my opinion. That's, that's true in stock so, trading so, and it's so, true in technology. So. so, yeah. So when you ask me well, quickly, the strategy about stock twits, stock twits was always, and you see the mistakes at Facebook, they're all closed. They all keep closing. Yep. They, uh, even Twitter, even though, even though Elon's free speech, he's, he could not be further from the truth. He's the most anti-free speech person in the world now that he has a free speech platform. Look what he did with Don Lemon. Hey, come on board. Yeah. Oh, I didn't like the interview. Shut him You're down. out. Yeah. Okay. There's like the opposite of free speech. And he'll claim, well, it's free speech. I don't like him. I go, no, you own a free speech platform right, and right. you fucking are the worst at it. Okay, so God bless. He's, he owns it. He owns it. There's another reason why blockchain is going to come. Like Farcaster, which I'm going to have to start using, is is growing, right? It's a decentralized Twitter. Uh, and all my friends are on it. Okay. So, and so I'm going to go there eventually. And the community owns it. So I didn't think, like, I don't have Twitter on my phone. So, so now you have to be everywhere again, which is fun. Yep. Okay, so every product and every brand needs to be everywhere. OK, and so that is what my new strategy at StockTwits is taking what's on StockTwits and sending it out into the world yep. to be consumed again. So Microsoft has this plan too, called Microsoft Everywhere. Why? They know that they lost mobile, right? They paid 13 billion for Nokia to play catch up and that didn't even work. Right. And AI, not only are they is open AI, did they get into open AI early? They just basically rolled up a competitor called Inflection AI to chew their own hand off. So they're hedging themselves and only Microsoft could pay a billion dollars for a company with no revenue. Um, so, so the AI game is already pretty much you just, baked you just with the big froze. guys. So you really have to find a skill um, that is not, you know, AI based. And that skill is very much more artisanal. And so so hopefully that helps. Yeah. Okay. Great. Howard, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you're actually you're an inspiration for a lot of things that I do. I didn't come out of so much of the community space. I came out of, you know, running and running the hedge funds and all that. But I, I I really appreciate, you know, the time you've taken, the mentorship. I actually think there's just some incredible ideas. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on them. Um, you know, and I look forward to uh to hanging out uh in Arizona as well as I'm actually starting to get very active on stock twits. I was uh, was talking to to you Tommy. Should, right? Yeah. Like we can have a lot of fun. No, you, I, I literally just, I, I actually just did a paid stock to its subscription. Like I want to say two days ago. So I get all the access and things like that. And I'm going to be ramping up in the next couple weeks. Pay so. for the no ad. If you, if, if you come to stock to it, say hello, CC me. If you have an idea, I'll help get you started in the community. Yeah, right. So it. again, we, I can help people hack the system. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Elon's helping people that like Chamath and David Sachs and 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 Tucker Carlson, right? Like Elon's twisting the algo. Right, right. At StockTwits, I still have the power not to twist the algo, but to help people well, get well, started. Well, maybe I can be your I'm not maybe I can be your Chamath, you know. <laughs> you could be our Chamath. I don't want to be your Tucker. No, but I'm saying, you know, my Chamath. Yeah. No, but you know what I mean? We're not going to have any of those people. Yeah, yeah, I know, Meaning, I know. I'm they're joking. on our site, yeah. but they're not going to get promoted by yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least if you come to StockTwits and say good ideas, I'm going to share yeah. them. So great. I promise. That's my one promise. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Appreciate it, Howard. Have a great day, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the HX Podcast here again, and we hope uh, everyone has a great day.